Welcome in another episode of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. I'm Jeff Goodman. He's Bob Ryan and uh, glad to be with you guys. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Ryan and Goodman podcast. Make sure you leave us your reviews as well. Um, and Bob, do you notice anything different here? Oh, I, I, I'm just ogling the raging Cajuns. Yes. Do, do you know, who's, you know who, who was number 24? Dwight Lamar. I don't know. Andrew Tony. Oh, Andrew Tony. My God. You know how I, I feel about Andrew Tony. I moved well, it from I, I one wall that. to the other for you. I, I moved it. I figured it, it, it'd be a little bit better than that blank wall behind me. I, I wanted to spruce <laughs> things up a little bit. So I figured uh, nothing like uh, people don't even know, you know, Southwest Louisiana back then. Now it's Louisiana Lafayette. I think even they're called Louisiana now. They don't even go by Louisiana Lafayette anymore. No, I liked, I liked it when they were Southwest Louisiana, but Oh yeah, and then Bo Peep, Bo Peep Lamar too. Let's not forget him. Roy Ebron. I've, I've heard the name. I, I don't remember him, but Roy Ebron. Okay. Six nine so. Tower of Power. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> listen. Speaking of of, of power, uh, there was power uh, by the NBA in getting this deal done with the NBA Players Association. The power was money, and that's what it came down down to ultimately. Sure. Because you know, listen. We're going with the December 22nd start date. It looks like everything's pretty much done uh, with that. A lot of the players didn't want this. I mean, LeBron didn't want this. But ultimately, it was in the best interest of the league and a lot of the younger guys um, and a lot of the other players that are going to make good money that are in the primes or early stages of their career. Because, And I give LeBron credit because he probably could have come out and said it's too soon. But ultimately, it's what's best for the players. It's what's best for the league. A 72-game schedule starting December 22nd. Um, I'm fine with it. I don't love it, but I understand it. Uh, first of all, the league's there's such a discrepancy. You've got eight teams that haven't played since March. Right. You've got a few more that haven't played since September. So for them, this is not a big uh, physical burden to have to have this brief a hiatus, okay? We have sympathy for the the two finalists and the, and the four semifinalists, but these are abnormal times. They got to suck it up. And you're right. They all, everybody wants the money. The owners want it. The players want it. They got, it's, they got to do this. And I, I mean, my sympathy is limited for LeBron. I mean, or any of them that, that would be, I mean, this is, it's not normal. And, and ultimately the big picture is not, uh, how much discussion do you think there is, or how, do you know about, about the desire to, get back to normal by 21, 22. Well, have... The other part of this one, Bob, was they had to finish in time for the Olympics. The Olympics. That, that you know, Olympics start July 23rd, run through early August, and they wanted to be done for the Olympics with enough times that, that and I don't even know how much of it was about the, the guys that are, that are going to play for the U.S. team because no, I, the, I just don't see a lot of those guys playing. It's, it's the international guys um, that, that are more necessary for their teams because they're not as loaded as the U S is U S can still send, you know, players, you know, uh, eight through 20 and be fine. They could send Jason Tatum in place of, of LeBron and probably still win this thing. Um, but some of those other countries cannot. So mm -hmm. I think they wanted to give them every opportunity to be able to play for their, their home countries in the Olympics and give them a little bit of time in between. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it, it, it's it's very important. It's become very important. Once upon a time, it was no inch, no um, connection at all. But ever since David Stern and Boris Tankovich got together uh, 30 years ago, well, and there's it is. OK, so, you know, it, it, it's but just as long as everybody understands that it, these are totally abnormal times and, and, and they, they had to come to this. I'm, I'm glad that there isn't you know, there's going to be grousing, but they're going to go along with the program. Right. Now, the next question up is the whole, we'll have plenty of time as we see how it unfolds and discuss it. Load management. Oh boy. You know, uh, I, I, there's one, to me, there's a couple, there's, there's load management and there's sit home. There's, and there's no, you know, no management. And are we, are we, are we, the threats, Danny Green has put it out there that LeBron, you know, maybe won't even play. But how uh, many teams, how many teams is that going to affect Bob? Right. It's, it's, Really, the Lakers? No more than four, you would think, uh, the, the last Celtics, four. And the Celtics, yeah, like with Kemba, with Gordon Hayward. But ultimately, it was probably going to affect them anyway. Like, to some degree, um, 
now a little bit more, but like if you're the Clippers, Kawhi is going to do it regardless. They didn't go as deep uh, as people thought they'd go. So it shouldn't, it's really more LeBron James, Anthony Davis, even though he's young, he's, you're going to protect him. And, and to me, why have him play back to back nights? They wanted all this past year. So the pressure's off them a little bit, especially to get a number one seed. What's the difference? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think, of course, this year's seeding, you know, because the no home court didn't matter at all. Right. And and I think it time oftentimes is overrated. So one thing is I guess the schedule's gonna they're gonna concoct the schedule so that when a team goes to LA, they'll play them both for sure. Yeah. When they come east in New York, they're playing the Nets and the Knicks for sure. Probably throwing the Celtics and 76ers right. if you're a Western team, yep. make sure that there's that kind of schedule. Um I'm sure it's going to be some scheduling whining. There's no question. You know, you always got teams like Seattle always travels more than uh, Seattle. They're not in the league. They used to be the team that traveled more than anybody, you know, but now maybe it's, it's uh, golden state because of their situation or Portland, excuse me. You know, they'll get that. I don't know. There's going to be, it, it, it's a not, it's a whole, we, we always kid about it's an imperfect world. Of course it is. It is a really imperfect world. Now and they're going to have to live with it. That's yeah, just crazy now, Bob. I'm thinking about the, the, the timeline now of basketball upcoming. Okay, so we've got uh, next, we've got the NBA draft, which is in 10 days from now, basically, November 18th. And we'll talk a little bit more about the draft uh, in, in a few minutes here. Um, then you've got the start of college basketball season a week later. We'll talk about that mess that is the scheduling of yes. college hoops. Then you've got camps opening December 1st. Bob, that's like three weeks from now. That's right. Three that's right. weeks from now. Now, again, the teams that didn't play in the bubble, they're going to be excited to get out there and, and, and open camp. Even yep. those teams that got knocked out early. I mean, it seems like an eternity ago that we were watching like Damian Lillard even, right? Yes, yes. And so like they've I, had absolutely. enough time. It, it's You're they, really talking about four teams that have, um, you know, some semblance of, of – of worry about this and how many guys on those teams are going to be affected. Yeah. Goran Dragic, Gordon Hayward, Kemba Walker, LeBron, some of the older guys for the, for the Lakers maybe, but they didn't get huge minutes. You're talking about honestly a half dozen, 10 guys that, that should be affected by this and should really load manage more than they were going to load manage um, in right. the first place. Right. I agree. I agree. So it's, it's, it's but they're, they're going to have their complaints, but they're, yep. Once again, uh, I, I don't want to be, they're, they're being well compensated for this effort and uh, they'll, uh, they got to learn to live with it. So, yeah. All right, let's it, go it in is, order, is, Bob. Let's go in order. Let, let's start with what's next, which is the NBA draft. And uh, I, gave draft. You homework, I gave you a little homework to do last week. Yeah, I, I, I checked out Lomelo and it, it reminded me an awful lot of Lonzo. I mean, it does. And yep. this, uh, you asked me to check out the shot. And the first shot release that came to my mind was Sean Marion. He kind of used to flip it up like that a little yep. bit. It was low because I go back to Bob McAdoo and who didn't have the three. Well, he did have it, but he didn't master it. But he had a low release, but it never seemed to bother him too much. But Sean Marion's the one. Now, who do you, uh, uh, and, uh, in addition to his brother, naturally, is there anybody else I missed that you're thinking of in that category of that kind of release? No, I mean, it's just so, you know, and, and I've watched him play since he was a freshman in high school. So. No. And I remember being out there uh, a couple of years ago. I was in in Chino Hills for a while, and I was I was joking with him. He was it was three years ago, maybe two and a half, three years ago, before he went to Lithuania that summer before. And he was trying to dunk, and he couldn't. And he was only like <laughs> six three, six four then. And I was making fun of him because he couldn't do it, and he tried it like ten or twenty times. And I'm like, come <laughs> on. And I actually I, I do like Lamelo. Underneath it all, I like him. I've talked a little bit about his issues that I've seen, and it's kind of that entitled, um, you know, he had a Lamborghini at 16 years old. His dad <laughs> has allowed him to um, play the way he does, which is which is undisciplined. And his dad has not given him the best coaching. His dad has not put him in the best situations to succeed and be held accountable. I mm. don't blame LaMelo Ball honestly for any of this i really don't i blame yeah, his father yeah. for all of it sure well it, i did there I, are a lot I, of bad I, habits i was always amazed that alonzo appeared to be as stable and, and as liked as he is but because given, bob because lonzo became lonzo before lavar became lavar so lonzo already had and you are right listen no doubt even with lavar um 
you could see that he could screw up Lonzo even, and, and he didn't. Lonzo's just so – he's so mature, and he always was so mature in on the court and off the court. Both. Yeah, yeah. I, I say, like, imagine – Imagine the situations, all the situations that his father put him in with his current coaches all along the line, right? Steve Alford at UCLA, high school coaches. Then obviously uh, with Luke Walton, um, you know, calling him out to me in, in, in Lithuania and killing Luke Walton. And never, ever, ever did Lonzo say a bad word about any of the coaches yeah. or his father through all of it. He somehow found a way to kind of be Switzerland and be neutral and stay above the fray, which um, is really impressive. So I, I, I remember we, I, we've, I'm sure we've had this conversation, but I remember thinking uh, back in in his original stint uh, that you know he must be with, with his inner relation, his relationship with his teammates. It's like he would walk in one morning and say, and the morning say, "Hey, Dad, at it again," you know. Oh, I know that, or or they would say to him, "Ah." Oh, your dad's at it again. You go, yeah, you know, but I, I know how to handle it. You know, I, I guess it's got to be something like that, right? It's got to yeah, be. No, no doubt. No doubt. It, it, I think it is. And, and I think, you know, the hard part uh, for LaMelo again was it came at a much earlier age than it did for Lonzo. The yeah. attention, um, all the uh, fanfare, everything like that. A Lamborghini again at 16 years <laughs> old. Um, so it, I think it was harder for him to handle. And again, being the only child, he was taken out of high school right away, you know, sent to Lithuania, playing pro, then in Australia last year. And, you know, getting back to LaMelo, the player. Yeah. Bob, and he's he's squarely in the mix for the number one overall pick right now. Anybody uh, Minnesota. I squarely. urge people go go YouTube him up and, yeah. and you'll the passing is really something um, ambidextrous. Yep. Uh, he's got that eye in the back of his head thing going. He's. He's really something, you know, he can pass. He can really, of course, you know, brother can too, but he can really pass the ball. Somebody's no, going to enjoy elite level. It's elite yeah. level court vision and passing ability. Nobody can say otherwise to me. I mean, no. similar, similar to Lonzo, but completely different than Lonzo because Lonzo makes it simple. LaMelo, everything. I, I compare him a little bit like Rondo in, in his passing and his court vision. Everything's dribble, 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 dribble no look. Right. Um, that was Rondo. Like he wanted, it was, it was always flashy. Um, a lot of it, I think for LaMelo is about attention um, and, and just flair, just you know flair. What, the you way know what the late great Al McGuire would call that French pastry. French pastry. French yep. pastry. Yep. Yep. That's so very for, true. for the very older true. folks, just think of Al and French pastry when you were having this discussion about LaMelo's passing MO. <laughs> so if, if I'm, Minnesota, and I have the number one pick. I'm going to uh, inquire every team to trade down. I'm going to try like hell to trade out of that number one spot. But if I'm Gerson Rosas in Minnesota, I'm not going to get enough for it. I, I know that going in is there's just no way I'm going to get enough for it. Maybe they can pull a veteran, you know, move, move down a little bit or a lot and get a veteran that can help them now in the locker room uh, because LaMelo. The hard part is, again, he's got a long way to go in terms of being a winning basketball player. You've got D'Angelo Russell. Uh, you've got Carl Anthony Towns. You need somebody, I think, that can help them now elevate themselves. Because if you add a good third piece, not named Andrew Wiggins, obviously, because yeah. they tried that one. Like, if you add a, a third piece to that that's, that's solid in the locker room, got some toughness to him. I think they could be a, a, a playoff team, or at least yeah. in the equation. LaMelo Ball is not going to make them a playoff team. I, I think LaMelo, it's funny. I, I compare LaMelo a little bit to Trey Young, but without the ability to shoot the basketball. Yeah. Like, he can't shoot. Trey Young shoots the hell out of it. Yeah. Doesn't play. He, he doesn't play any defense. Neither does LaMelo. Neither one plays any defense. They're both elite-level passers. I actually think LaMelo is a better passer better court vision than Trey, but Trey's really good. Um, the difference is Trey can rise up from 35 feet and make shots. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like LaMelo really can't. He shot 25% from three in Australia. That shot is broke right now. It's gotta be corrected. I don't know if they've been working on it with him. You know, with Lonzo it was different. It was broke, but he shot like 37% from three at UCLA in this one season. So it was almost like, 
Well, you couldn't tell him it was broke at that point because <laughs> he had just come off a season where he had, he had made enough. Yeah, yeah. You had to wait another year before you started to work on it. With LaMelo, you wonder if they've already uh, taught him that, mm -hmm. hey, you know what, we got to start working on this now because yeah. it is not going to work in the league. Interesting. All right, I want to move to another guy for me because a guy that uh, I, I call him the yeah, but guy. Okay. Anthony Edwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but. Everybody's yeah. intrigued with the body, yeah. the look, the, the profile, yeah. right, of, of the pro. And yet there's this yeah, but. You, I'll, I'll throw the ball in your court now. You agree? Yeah, I went down. I've seen him. I'd seen him a few times in, in AU and I went down to Athens, Georgia at the beginning of last season. And uh, yeah, no doubt the yeah, but is, is, is there because he's, he's very streaky. Uh, now I, I do think in his defense, Tom Crean used him the wrong way last year. He tried to use him at the point and he's not a point guard. He's clearly a two guard. He's a guy that can attack can score. He looks the part. He's a freak. He's going to everything athletically, all this stuff, you know, the combine, he's going to blow it away. And mm -hmm. people are going to be like, oh, my God, he can jump high. He, yes, he's a freak athlete. Well, there are a lot of freak athletes that weren't great basketball players. That's right. This kid shot under 40% from the field and 29% from three. And more worrisome than that, Bob, is the fact that his team absolutely stunk last year. Yep. When college basketball wasn't very good, when the SEC wasn't great, uh, his team was towards the very bottom. I think they only finished ahead of Vanderbilt in the SEC last year. They won five games in the league. They were 16 and 16 overall. And if he's the number one pick, to me, you got to win more games than that. We we ripped on Ben Simmons oh, yeah. for not winning a lot of games at LSU. Well, he at least had his team in the equation for an NIT bid. This kid, they were 16 and 16 overall. They weren't going to go to any postseason last year. And he kind of threw in the towel at the end of the year. He was a great – when I saw him, he actually was a great teammate. He was he was on the bench. It was very early in the season in, in December. And when he wasn't on the court, he was still on the bench, cheering on his guys, talking to the walk-ons, very engaged. As the season went on and they lost games, he became less and less engaged. And his body language was not great. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the NBA teams have soured on Anthony Edwards. Hmm. Uh, we've talked a little bit in the past about James Weissman. Uh, I want to ask you a question. I, back in the day when I was really, really conversant with the draft more than I am today, but, but I, and I had to do my draft previews and I did all my draft diligence and I wrote the, oh my God, you know, for years and years yeah. and years, but there was always a player or two that I was rooting for, you know, that I, I really liked, I wasn't sure how much, you know, but is there, you got a guy like that in this draft is somebody that, you know, down there in the eight to 20, anywhere in there that you really like that you're curious to see who's going to love him and are they going yeah, to like Yeah, there's a bunch. I, I really think that's the strength of this this year's draft. I think there's a bunch of guys and, and a bunch of three and D type guys, guys that could shoot the three and, and really guard. Devin Vass I love the two kids coming out from Florida State. Devin, oh, Vassell, okay. Devin Vassell is a three and D guy who, who is size, can really shoot the hell out of the ball and can really guard. Mm -hmm. And Pat Williams is a six, eight, 225 pound man who came off the bench in every game last year at Florida state, his numbers were like, I don't know. I think he averaged like nine points and five rebounds playing 20 minutes a game, but he is kind of that new age forward who can do everything. Like he can be a Jalen Brown type, but he's much bigger and stronger, but he's a great defender. I think he's going to be good enough offensively um, to be able to score. He's never going to be a 20 point a game guy. Um, but those are two guys coming out of Florida State I absolutely love because they guard. Like, you know what you're going to get at least out of both of them, putting them on the court, and Vassell can shoot the hell out of it and guard. I think this is what the Celtics need. At 14, they need somebody to fall to them. Maybe they can move up a couple spots. If they love a guy at, like, 12, you know, they could trade mm -hmm. 14 and one of their other picks or both of their other first-round picks and try to move up a couple spots if they love a guy at 12 I just don't see a lot of difference it's kind of again like beauty in the eyes of the beholder at that point who do you love do you love Aaron Neesmith at Vandy who's, Aaron, I was going to ask you about Aaron Neesmith he was the best shooter you know percentage wise last year he only played about 15 games and then he got hurt but he shot uh, the hell out of the ball yeah, he was a 50%, 50 three point 83 percent free throw guy yep and 
Not yeah, as I, 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 I starred him Celtics question mark. Yeah. Cause yeah. you know what I know, what I believe that, that they need above everything else. A couple of guys I want to throw at you. One that people know about, and we're going to have some curiosity about, and that's Cole Anthony. <laughs> I can uh, go on about Cole. Oh, that's a, a I'm a, you know, but you know, everybody knows who daddy is. Yes. Everybody knows where he's coming from. Everybody, you know, he's going to be a name, you know, people are going to be curious about, I think. He, he was the number one player coming out of high school. A lot of people had him at number one. And, <laughs> and even I thought, uh, again, he was, he was so tough in AAU ball. A winner could really score the basketball. The, the problem was at Carolina, they were atrocious last year. Um, <laughs> now, I give Cole credit because he came back. He was injured, and instead of calling it a day and shutting it down, he came back at the end of the season and played, uh, even though Carolina was terrible and they had no chance of making the tournament. He did come back, so I give him credit for that. My biggest thing with Cole Anthony, Bob, is I don't know what he does great. You know, he's not a great athlete. He doesn't make people better. He doesn't shoot the ball well from three. So I, I think he's the type of guy that you bring off the bench in your second unit and you just say, hey, you know what? We're going to give you the ball. Go score the ball. You know you know who he's like? He's very similar to me than, than Austin, to Austin Rivers. Very, oh, okay. very similar. Both okay. have dads who played professionally. Uh, both probably had a higher opinion of themselves um, coming out of college than, than they should have. But, but they have that swagger too, which helps them. Right in Austin, it took Austin a while to kind of figure out his way in the NBA and figure out his place and his role. And I think the same thing is going to happen with Cole Anthony. He thinks he's a star or a frontline guy. No, no, you're, you're going to be a piece. You're going to be a guy coming off the bench, I think, ultimately for a good team. Or you could, yeah, maybe you could play major minutes for a really shitty team. Here's somebody that's going to be something of a mystery man for most fans, including me but I would suspect you have some read on it. And that would be RJ Hampton. Yeah. So the big thing with him, he, he, he did not go to college. Uh, he was, everybody thought he was going to go to Kansas. Instead, he went to New Zealand and uh six, six long, really, really long can guard. Uh, he's, he's, he's all about versatility. The, the one thing he couldn't do though, is shoot the ball. Hmm. So, you know what he did this past summer, he enlisted the help of Mike Miller, down in Memphis really to help him shoot the ball who better right yeah good so his shot looks much better on tape um I've seen video and I've talked to Mike Miller and, and he's gotten better RJ Hampton um he's still he's still a ways away because physically he, he doesn't have the strength yet but mm -hmm. he's a guy that you're taking you know hoping that on his second contract he works enough really good kid works hard enough in shooting the basketball to become a, a, an above average uh, shooter you know his body is like similar a little bit stronger than, than Sean Livingston that's kind okay. of he's got that type of body okay uh don't get too deep in this today but uh projected very high is someone from the uh, Israel whose last name yeah. I, I do not it's Denny Udia Udia Ab Abdia Abdia uh, Abdia okay Abdia yep. right yep. six nine uh skinny I guess but um anyway what do we, he's projecting very high yeah, he, he, he knows how to play, uh, deceptive athlete, long, skilled, kind of a guy who could play some point forward type, shoots it pretty well, not great, um, played at a high level, obviously, in Israel. You know, he's a guy that, listen, to me, again, I say it, I say it, I say it, like this draft is so weak at the top, but can somebody kind of sneak in there that we didn't expect because of that? Because teams are going to have questions about LaMelo. They're going to have questions about Anthony Edwards. James Wiseman, I don't think you could take if you're Minnesota because you no, already have Carl Anthony Towns. They got Towns. You know, Golden State should – if Golden oh. State can't trade out of there, if they yeah. can't get a player to help them now because they have a trade exception that they can use, if they if they stay pat at number two, I, I feel like it's a no-brainer to take James Wiseman. Take, take a complete no-brainer because – I'm going to throw yeah. one other one out there yeah, that ahead. I happen to have seen in person with my own eyes, oddly. Yep. Caught my eye. There's a second reason, which we'll get to why he caught it, what catches everybody's eye. And I went, oh, please, God, don't let him think about coming out yet. You know that line, you know. Okay. And, of course, he did. And that's Precious Achua. Precious Achua. Precious Achua. Precious Achua. You know, the only thing I'll say about him, he was better than I thought he'd be last year. I mean, he, 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 he rebounded at a high level, 
with James Wiseman leaving, remember he got that NCAA suspension and bolted on Memphis. It helped Precious more than anybody else because he was forced to have to play in the middle. He wanted yeah. to be a a, a, a four three, right? Coming into the year, he really wanted to be a four three. Uh huh. Okay. The perimeter, and instead he had to be a four five because Wiseman, uh, you know, left the team. And Precious rebounded at a high level. He's just not super skilled. You know, but could he be a Bam out of bio type? That's what people are thinking. Seven two wingspan. Yeah, keep that in mind, yep. folks. Yep. Yeah. All right, we we're not going to go through all of them. Um, uh, is there anybody else that deserves a little? T- all right, all right. Here's one though. Go ahead. Killian Hayes. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, you know, obviously from France, a big point guard. The point guards in this draft, there's not a lot of separation between a lot of these guys. You know, do you go Killian Hayes? Do you go Tyrese Halberton? People love Halberton. Other people don't really envision him as a high-end point guard. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Killian Hayes. Um, it's just, again, it's a very um, average draft in the top, like, seven or eight. You're like, eh. Like, I, I honestly think, and, and maybe I'm crazy here, but I, I think there's – you can make a case to take Obi Toppin number one. Well, I was going to say, we're going to exit the draft with one more name, and that's the name. Yeah. To me, he he's the comfort food pick. Totally. Yes. He's safe. He's the <laughs> safest because he's a freak athlete. You could play small ball with him at the five. He could play the four. He's terrible defensively right now. But can he be average defensively and – what he did last year was he was able to step out and shoot it from, from the three point line. And if he can do that as a four man, who's a freak athlete. And if he plays hard in the defensive end and locks in, I just feel like, yeah, like maybe you can get 15 and eight out of them. And if you can get 15 and eight out of somebody right now with the number one pick, yeah. Oh, I yeah. think a lot of people would take it. All right. The colorful days of fall are now upon us. Are your small businesses needs evolving? Despite the current uncertainty, having the right people on your team is like feeling the warmth of being wrapped in a blanket. So when your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so that you can find the right person and find them quickly. LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 706 million members worldwide. Getting started easier than ever with new features to help you find qualified candidates and find them quickly. You can manage job posts and contact candidates from a single view on the familiar LinkedIn.com as functions are streamlined onto one simple screen. Identify strong candidates with our efficient rating system to help quickly to get your job in front of more qualified candidates. And now you can do this all from your mobile device, no matter where the day takes you. That's how LinkedIn jobs can help you hire the right person and do it faster. When your business is ready to make that next hire, find the right person with LinkedIn jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash scribe. Again, that's linkedin.com slash scribe to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. So there, there's, your, there's your quick your quick rundown of, of the NBA draft. Um, we'll give you more next week, although Bob, Bob's got some, some heavy hitters coming up for our next few guests, don't you, Bob? Well, I'm Hopefully. very pleased to say that we've got a commitment uh, – for next week from the new coach of the Houston Rockets, Stephen Silas. And uh, I'm excited about that. We go back a long way, although he doesn't know it. And uh, we'll get to that story. You think he knows that story? Do you think he's I heard that story? I don't know if daddy told him that story. I hope not. We got to tell um, him. That, that's going to be great. And the week after, uh, on the Monday the 16th, two days in advance of the draft, uh, Brad Stevens said he'd be happy to join us. So we're very excited about both of those. Yeah, no, those uh, would be good. Those would be really good. Interesting week in terms of uh, losses in in, in the basketball world. Uh, College basketball world lost one of the great characters and also one of the damn good coaches of the last 40 years or so. Uh, The ever controversial Billy Tubbs, who burst onto the scene at Lamar, which I believe was his alma mater, and then transformed Oklahoma. We got to talk about what he did to elevate that program and then went to TCU. 85 years old. Um, I'm sure that in the basketball world, there are lots of stories that were being told, <laughs> but I got to start with the most famous one. So people who don't know on, uh, on uh, February 2nd, 1989 
in a game against February 9th, excuse me, uh, the Sooners were playing Missouri and things weren't going Billy's way with calls on the court. <laughs> and the fans started throwing debris on the court. And Billy Tubbs took the microphone and said, and I quote, the referees request that regardless of how terrible the officiating is, do not throw stuff on the floor, unquote. <laughs> and Ed Hightower said, see you later, Billy. That's uh, it, that's, you're done. That's a funny story, but you know, he's gonna be, be remembered for that. Here's what I'm gonna be remember most of all. I think the 1988 Oklahoma team is very much in the discussion as the best team that never won the NCAA tournament. And yeah, one of the, uh, and it was a, an yep. upset, that I believe if they played 10 times, Kansas beats them twice, maybe. But Danny and the Miracles beat an Oklahoma team that started three NBA draft, uh, four NBA draft picks and three that played. I don't know how far Ricky Grace Who's the got. fourth? Mookie, Mookie, uh, Stacey Harvey King, Grant, Harvey Grant. Harvey Who's Grant, Stacey King, yeah. Mookie Blaylock, and then Ricky Grace. I'm not oh, sure yeah, how Ricky far Grace. Ricky Grace went, but yeah. that was a hell of a backcourt. Yes. And um, fifth starter was Seeger, Dave Seeger. Um, anyway, but Billy Tubbs, the, what, he he was a character. Now he 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 shook up the big the then Big Eight, later Big Ten, twelve of uh, Big Twelve, with his aggressive offense and his relentless offense, his running up scores, and and you know he did, and he had made he was utterly unapologetic about running up scores. Basically, I, I, his, miss, I, remember, I miss that. I miss the. The, the personalities we've got some in college basketball, but um, back then you had Billy ball. Uh, you had so many, per and he was a guy, like you said, he didn't give a shit. He didn't. No, give he didn't. He, he, he would say things like, you know, go see the JV game or whatever, you know, you go to D go to D three. I don't care. I, I'm playing my guy, you know, anyway, but he, you know, we, we know that Bob Knight had a profound influence on the entire big 10 back in the seventies and eighties. Right. I mean, he affected it in different ways. Everybody reacted to him. Billy Tubbs walked into a league that was a walk it up league. And in fact, his arch rival Oklahoma State was the grandfather, it was the ultimate grandfather with Hank Ivor winning dual championships in the 40s and then just walking up off the floor in the 50s and 60s. And he went into this league and said, uh uh. And he shook up that league and he took Oklahoma. And there's a great quote here from the, um, uh, no, I got it from the, the third, his third year. Yeah, his third year um, at the job after he had settled in and it was. Blue Ribbon Magazine, God love them, said before the 82-83 season, Oklahoma basketball has become much more than a way to kill time between fall and spring football. <laughs> and it remains that way. And it's yeah. all because Billy Tubbs got – John McLeod had been there, and he couldn't do it. No, the, the previous – I think I saw a stat. The previous 32 years before Tubbs got there, they went to the NCAA tournament once. Yeah, and that includes once. with John McLeod. Who, and they who, went eight straight years after after he brought in Wayman Tisdale. They yes. went eight straight years. Yeah. And so, man, like they were, like you said, I remember they beat in that in that 88 Final Four, they beat my alma mater, they beat Arizona, a team with Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr, Kenny Lofton, Tom mm -hmm. Tolbert, Anthony Cook. That team was loaded, loaded. That was one of the better games of, of the tournament. I was young then, but – that's when I kind of fell in love. I was in <laughs> high school, I guess. Um, fell in love with college basketball around then. Uh, but that game was 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 really good. And then Danny Manning, like you said, just absolutely. Danny, dominated. you know that game. Danny went for thirty-one and eighteen. Milt Newton went six for six. And uh, uh, one more guy. Uh, oh, Kevin Pritchard had uh, thirteen. Kevin Pritchard was on so that they team. had they had uh, fifty-nine of the eighty and some points that they scored in that game. And, you know, they deserve to win, but I, I, Oklahoma was loaded. They were absolutely loaded. Uh, that was a great run between 85, Villanova, Georgetown, and 89, oh. Michigan, Seton Hall, of, of terrific championship games yeah. in a row because of either the game itself was really, really good or because of the, the oh, my God, I can't believe the other team's winning. Louisville beating Duke, that was a tremendous Duke oh team. Oh, my God. No, right? you're right. You're right. The Indiana-Syracuse game, you know, goes down to the last shot. We have this game, which shook up the world. And then 89, you know, my God, you know, Romeo Robinson and, and et cetera, uh, that team winning. So that was a wonderful run. of Billy, Billy Tubbs, uh, yeah, he passed away 
uh, in Norman, Oklahoma at, at 85 years old. He, he's been battling leukemia since 2015. The other person that I know you wanted to talk about a little bit was Fast Eddie Johnson. And, that, now, 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 Fast Eddie Johnson passed away at age 65. And it's a, it's a, this, it's just a uncomfortable, sad, sad, sad story. story. Eddie Johnson was good enough to not just play, start two All Star games. Right, right. Eighty nine and ninety, he he had twenty two and one and eighteen in the other. He was a really top flight player for the Hubie Browns Hawks, and he was a coke addict. And he was a bad coke addict, and it and it 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 wrecked his career, and wrecked his life. He became a criminal and wound up he died in the custody of Uncle Sam yeah. in a, a serving a life sentence in Leesburg, Florida. For um, sexual assault of an eight-year-old girl. Yes, it's a terrible story. I mean, he was banned and, and for life from the NBA, right? He was banned for life yeah, because of cocaine. He was, but he, I'm telling you how good, I can, here's my everlasting memory uh, when he was playing for the Hawks. Uh, when they'd get a lead and Hubie was coaching, they went into a 1-4 with him handling the ball out front. Really? And went into a 1-4 and let him handle the ball with the whole 24 and decide and make a play. It, it, you couldn't contain him. The, he killed the Celtics. They, the, no yeah. guard could contain him physically. Okay. Wow. Now the the subplot of Eddie Johnson in this whole story is that there were two Eddie Johnsons. Right. Right. And the other one I call Illinois Eddie Johnson, and and he was 17 years in this league, including a year when he was sixth man of the year, a terrific outside shooter, a wonderful guy. You know, everybody loves him. Radio I play radio guy. I've done his radio shows. You know, radio guy. Uh, and, and at the time of one of Eddie's, maybe when he got convicted of this one, his transgressions, someone mistakenly posted the wrong headshot out there. Oh, in the world. No. And poor Illinois Eddie had to deal yeah. with this yeah. poop of being accused coke addict child molester. You know, Man. but it, it was cleared up. And I hope, yeah. you know, to, but that, uh, but one other subplot before we close, uh, he had a younger brother, Frankie. And Frank Johnson was a, was a, I'll tell you, a, a, a streaky, but oh my God, shooter. Who who I remember with? one night. Who did Frankie play with? Who is his Bullets, the old Bullets among old others. Bullets. Okay. And, That's right. and he, he could, he, he shot it from Curry land. Let me tell you. Did he really? Let me tell you. Yes. He shot it from Curry land in the early days of the three. And it was a playoff series, Jeff. I think it was 82. I'll look it up. Against the Bullets, the old Bullets, where they changed the nickname. And it was a five game series, Celtics won four to one, but it was a terrific series. And it was a double overtime game on Sunday afternoon and, and Landover, there was an overtime game. And with, I remember, I could still see Frankie coming down the court and bombing three, you know, Curry land shots in a row. Anyway, he's the younger brother and I, my condolences go out to Frankie and the rest of the family. And, and it's just such a, it, it's a Coke story. It's an incredible story of the power of the drug. And, 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 but yep. it, it, it's, it's sad. Eddie, but Eddie could play this game, but that Coke wrecked his life. Well, listen, uh, before, before we, uh, we wrap, I, I want, I got one more thing to throw your way. I want to know why, why you hate Kit Kats that much. I don't hate Kit Kat. Who said I did? Was I Kit Kats. Twix. No, it Twix. Was, Twix. I didn't hate it. You don't I like Twix. I had, I, it was out of my world. It was, I was an unknown Candy How do you food. not know Twix? I know everybody's asking that. Do I don't mean? know. I didn't. And this all took about, I'll, I'll quickly, about a month ago, there was a, a tweet and someone had pictures of four candy bars right. and said, which one of these, it was the three effect, which one of these would you get rid of first or something like that? And and they were Milky Way, Snickers, Reese's, Peanut Butter Cup, and Twix right. in the lower right hand corner. I had never heard of Twix. Somehow I had escaped. <laughs> I don't know why. I had never heard of it. Never eaten one. Never heard of it. Not even did eaten one. Never heard of it. So wow. I put up. My response was, "What the hell is a Twix?" <laughs> now here's where. Let me fast forward. As a result of all this, I was on a Levitard show, and they and I promised them I would eat a Twix, and I I had a picture taken of me enjoying my first Twix. You know, I liked it. Okay. Yeah, Good. I like it. I'll, I would eat it again. And I posted this, a tweet. So far, as of the, this morning, I had 5,730 likes, which is more than any response I've ever had to anything political, entertainment, or sports. I'm serious. It's our current world, Bob. Our current world. Retweets. It makes no sense. On Twix. Yes, yes. So I was, I, 
It's pretty good. I said you know it was it a says? late lottery pick. You know a what it says, Bob? Candy. Tweet, tweet about candy more. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I stopped eating as a rule, except for very rarely candy about five years ago because I had heart surgery and I, you know, I changed my diet and I feel terrific. I'm doing great, you know, but so I stopped eating it. I, I stopped a lot of things. And so I haven't been eating candy much at all in the last five years. Every once in a while, you know, I'm, I can indulge. I can eat anything I want. I what just do you do? What, what's your go-to candy? If you can oh, have any peanut butter cup, okay. it's always been. Can I tell you, I don't like peanut butter. Wow. I don't like peanut butter. That's, that's stunning. Cause I, isn't that I'm, crazy? I'll, I'll eat can, anything. I will eat anything, Bob. I will not eat. The only two things that I really don't like in this world are peanut butter. And I had a bad experience with full blueberries when I was a kid. I will not eat a full blueberry. I'll eat, I love like blueberry muffins, uh -huh. blueberry low, whatever else. If it's, if it's baked into something, I'm good. But a, a, a real blueberry, I cannot touch. No, no chance. That's funny. Cause I, I, I eat them a lot. Cause I, I eat them. I eat blueberries probably in some form of about five days a week. Really? Yeah, because they're, they're in, uh, I eat them with yogurt and granola. I eat them um, on top of oatmeal because I stopped using brown sugar, which I loved instead of I have to eat it with oatmeal. And, and um, you know, I eat them and I eat fruit and, and a mixed fruit, a mixed fruit. Why can't we get, we should get Twix to, to, to sponsor uh, this podcast. Oh, I, I should be doing endorsements now, right? you know? I, I mean, mean, seriously, Twix, you know, like, all, it's I didn't bad. eat it's, 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 For how many years people you said, eat Twix? And then people said to me, uh, some of the uh, other responses were, about all those years you were going through airports, you never ate a Twix. Well, that's so funny how your mind works in certain ways. My airport go-to yeah. was Hershey with almonds. See, I go Hershey without almonds. Love oh, it. Oh, I go Hershey. Got to have the almond. Really? I mean, I'll eat the almond chocolate, but I want the almonds. Yeah. That's my, that was my airport. Movies, it was, it was peanut butter. It was Reese's, period. Reese's, wow. always. And then- I like I'm a, and I'm I loved it when caps. they came up with the big one, the really big one. Then, you know, suddenly you got four. I, I could never, I could eat, I could live on Reese's peanut butter cups. So <laughs> there, there you have it. There you have it. All right. Next, next week. We're, uh, we're, we're, promising, Silas. we're getting a commitment from Steven Silas. So uh, um, we I'm can find out what type that. of candy bar he likes. We, we will. We will find, we'll ask everybody in the end.